Matthew 1, verses 18 to 25. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he considered these things, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he'll save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they'll name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When Joseph got up from sleeping, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but he did not know her intimately until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, there's an outline there on the other side of that A5 sheet giving you a roadmap uh, of where we're going. Every family has their traditions at Christmas, don't they? Uh, growing up, uh, because of the household I grew up in, uh, we'd have people around for dinner on Christmas Eve and then we'd all open one present. Uh, we'd do church a number of times and then we'd come home from that service, uh, grab a ham sandwich, fall asleep, then we'd open presents and then we'd all go to the beach. Uh, kind of year in, year out, we had that rough routine. Then Boxing Day, uh, we'd all hop in the car from Kiama or Maruba and drive up to Sydney and do Christmas with the other side of the family uh, who we weren't able to be with. Uh, routine, things we do year in, year out. Every now and again, it's good to break a routine, isn't it? And break the routine and actually just remove yourself from it, sit down and observe everything that's going on, just so you get another perspective on it. In fact, I think that's one of the simple pleasures at Christmas. Sometimes you can just creep away in a corner and just watch people, can't you? Just look at facial expressions and listen to noises. Sometimes it gives you a new perspective on the familiar. Now you might get a slightly different reaction or an angle on what you've taken for granted. Or you might catch a small grin from a child or an adult. You might hear a squeal of delight or maybe you might catch a tear or a look of lostness. Sometimes when you just sit back and you look at things and you consider them, you get a different perspective, don't you? I, I want to do that this morning. I, I want to do that this morning with a passage that many of us are very familiar with. Most of you here could tell us the four big building blocks of Christmas, what happened before, what happened then, who visited and what happened afterwards. Uh, we're all familiar, well at least we think we're familiar with these events, aren't we? I want to just go through it again quite simply and then make four observations that have come to me this week because I've thought about Christmas sitting in the corner and looking at something familiar. Let me pray and then we're going to do that together. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Father, thank you that you sent your son. Thank you that you made sure the world knew. And still today in a town like Narrabri, we remember those events from many years ago. Father, they're familiar uh, we're in a routine. Uh, we know roughly what the day holds and where things will happen. At this point, help us to take a step back, uh, to sit in the corner and to just look at these events with a fresh eye and to see what is taking place and what your heart is in these events. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at point two on the outline, Joseph and Mary. Uh, Joseph comes from one of the most famous families in the whole nation of Israel. Uh, it's the family of the greatest king ever, David. We know nothing about Mary's family, uh, but we do know she's pregnant. Uh, from Joseph's perspective and from the gossip of a small country town, this is a disaster. He resolves to deal with the matter privately, quietly, largely because of his concern for Mary. One night he has a dream. An angel speaks and the angel sheds light on the matter. The child growing in Mary is the result of God's work. The child is a boy, the boy will be called Jesus, and he has the most amazing life ahead of him. He'll save his people from their sins. Please notice the certainty of the angel. Nothing will stop these events. At this point, Matthew interjects in his account. He does it a number of times, and he offers an explanation. 
by quoting another part of God's word. More than 700 years before, and Matthew says, what is happening now with Joseph and Mary fits God's pattern of behaviour. God wants to live with his mob and he'll do everything to do it. Well, back to the events at hand, Joseph is one of those quiet, unsung heroes of the birth of Jesus. He listens to God, shock horror, he actually obeys him. And the birth takes place. The boy is named Jesus. You know those events, don't you? You're quite familiar with them. Uh, They are real events. I want to make that very clear. They took place. But no matter how familiar you are with them, I want us to take a step back, sit for a moment, and to observe four things quietly. I'm at point three on the outline. Before we go any further, let me just remind you of who Matthew is. Uh, Matthew is a man who has been impacted by the life of Jesus, Uh, not just the birth, but Jesus' adult life. In chapter nine of his Good News biography of Jesus, Matthew describes meeting Jesus and how his life was completely transformed. Uh, At that point, Matthew was what we'd call an outsider. Uh, He was on the margins of society. He was a Jew working as a tax collector for the occupying Romans. That's not going to make you anyone's friend, is it? He was an outsider to his own mob and an outsider to the Romans. Uh, When he met Jesus, he became an insider. He was accepted as he was. He was completely changed and brought into God's mob. So when Matthew writes this, that's the background he's coming from. And that transformation sits there. The the first observation I want to make concerns one very small word. It's a small word in the Greek. It's translated with a number of words in our English. It's used there in verse 1 of chapter 1 and verse 18 in our reading. Uh, In verse 1 of Matthew 1, it's described as the genealogy. In verse 18 there, it's described as the birth. It's the same Greek word in both instances. We get the Greek word Genesis from it. Uh, It's a word that would have raised all sorts of awareness for Matthew's original readers. You see, in their translation of the Old Testament, it's the name of the first book of the Bible, Genesis. Uh, And then when you open Genesis and you read it, their translation... Uh, It's the word used repeatedly throughout Genesis to describe the next stage of the world's development and growth, the next generation of humans to be central to God's plan. So when Matthew uses this word, he's making sure we remember all of that history. He wants us to understand that the birth of Jesus happened in the context of all global history, the creation of the world. And as the birth takes place, it doesn't do so in the way the world was created, but in the way the world has become. Jesus was born not into the created world, but the fallen world, wasn't he? That's why we had the reading from Genesis 3. That fallenness happened through the rebellion of humans against God. Humans thought, well, we can bear the image of God, but we can do a better job than God. We can do without God. And the world broke. And so Jesus is born, Matthew wants us to know, into that global history, that world of conflict, a world racked by sin where every human wants to be God. You cannot separate the birth of Jesus from the history of everything that's come before. In fact, if you're following the pattern of Genesis, this is the next most significant moment in the history of the world. We started with these are the records, the genesis of the heavens and the earth concerning their creation at the time the Lord God made the heavens and the earth, Genesis 2. If we started there, then here we're at the point where creation broken begins to turn and the birth of one who'll deal with the sin that broke it. So when Matthew says Jesus' birth came about in this way, don't think just on that day. Think about all of the days that came before. The whole history of the world, the succession of Genesis that was broken by human sin. You can't understand Christmas without understanding that global history of creation and fallenness. 
In case that context is too big for us to comprehend, and sometimes it is, especially on a day like today, Matthew also wants to make us understand that the birth of Jesus is about personal relationships. And we know how unsettling they can be on a day like today, don't we? How conflictual they might become. Joseph and Mary were in a deeply committed personal relationship and Mary's pregnancy unsettled all that, didn't it? Mary's pregnancy threw a spanner in the works in the context of all the relationships in a small town, all the personal interaction. And who broke in? Well, God broke in, didn't he? Now, we're given a heads up, aren't we? We're given a suggestion there in verse 18 of what's taking place, but there in a dream, God breaks in. Just imagine that dream. The one who made Joseph speaks to Joseph. The image bearer hears the one who gave him his image. It doesn't get more personal than that, does it? And when God does speak to Joseph, his explanation of what is taking place is most personal. Look there in verse 20. But after he considered these things, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son and you're to name him Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. Jesus is God himself come to deal with the sin of his people. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, Is there anything more personal than sin? More personal than when humans say to the one who made them, whose image they bear, we can do without you, go away please. Sin is remarkably personal. Sin is always relational. Sin is the rejection of God, the rebellion against him, and all it does is bring conflict into the world. And yet what does God do? God himself chooses to come and deal with that sin. That is deeply personal, isn't it? Deeply relational. The expression of the grace of God his undeserved kindness and generosity to those who've turned their back on him. That grace actually enters into that world of conflict in human flesh so that humans could be saved from all the sin they have committed. You can't understand Christmas without understanding the deeply personal nature of the relationships expressed at the first Christmas. You can't understand Christmas without understanding grace. And that grace is profoundly unsettling because it confronts our sin and calls us to be saved. There are so many desires at Christmas. This is the third observation. Uh, Lots of desires about what's under the tree. Many of those desires have already been explored as presents have been poked and prodded and shaken. But there were desires at the first Christmas too, weren't there? The desire of Joseph to do the right thing. The desire of Mary to deal with the rumours. The desire of Mary and Joseph to do the right thing by this little child. But did you notice the key desire there in verses 22 and 23? Now all this took place to fulfil what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son. They'll name him Emmanuel, which is translated God is with us. Matthew understands these events, these desires, through a desire expressed more than 700 years before. Uh, The details are simple. God's mob are in a mess because they doubt God and have rejected him. The leader of God's mob is in a mess because he doubts whether God cares. God sends a messenger. This was the reading from Isaiah 7 that Bill brought us. God sends a messenger to reassure the leader, just trust me. Ask for any picture and I'll give it to you. The leader refuses and God says, well, my desire is going to stand. I want to be with my mob and I'm going to come. That's God's pattern of behaviour all the time, wanting to live with his people. Did you notice it in the Genesis 3 reading when Adam and Eve say no thanks to God? And what what does God do in the calm of the evening? He comes to find them because his desire is to be with his people time and time again. God expresses that desire throughout history. Time and time again, human sin gets in the way. Time and time again, God persists until this moment. And finally, God has come in the flesh. 
That's God's desire. You can't understand Christmas without understanding the depth of the passion of God's desire. I want to live with you and I'm going to do everything I can to overcome the sin that separates us. We're up to the fourth observation. All that's played out in three very short scenes. World history, reality of conflict, personal relationships, grace of God. Look what happens in the last scene, verse 24. When Joseph got up from sleeping, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her but did not know her intimately until she gave birth to a son and he named him Jesus. Do you notice that the birth account about Jesus begins and ends with Joseph? Up there in verse 18 and down there in verse 24 and 25. In verse 18, Joseph is profoundly unsettled and moving away from Mary to, in the end, Joseph listening to God and obeying him. He's really such a quiet figure, isn't he, Joseph? But he hears God's word and then obeys it completely. He listens and obeys. You can't understand Christmas unless you pay attention to Joseph, who listens and obeys. Well, that brings us to the last point on the outline. It's a really a simple account an account we're familiar with, but sometimes taking a seat back, observing those familiar events, we might see them in a new light. Christmas needs to be understood against the backdrop of global history and broken human nature. Christmas needs to be understood in the context of personal relationships and the way grace meets sin. Christmas needs to be understood as the moment when God's desire to be with his people reaches its climax And Christmas is the moment when listening leads to obedience. So what do we do with it? Well, in your outline there, you'll see four very simple applications. First, please remember the relevance of Christmas in a sin-broken world. Christmas remains remarkably relevant, not because of its economic impact, not because of its holiday expression, not because of the way it brings people together, Christmas remains relevant because it expresses God's eternal concern for a sin-ravaged world. Just as the first Christmas bore the stain of sin, so every Christmas since. At a time when the Middle East is damaged by war, when the Ukraine continues to suffer, when some of us are groaning because the earth burns and others are drowning because the earth floods, when we're impacted by personal relationships that might be strained, Christmas continues to speak that God is concerned about the root issue, the root issue of our brokenness and the damage it brings. Christmas is still relevant. Secondly, please recognise the unsettling grace of Christmas. Christmas does remain unsettling, not just because of the cost of living. Christmas remains unsettling because of the wonder of God's grace. It unsettles Mary and Joseph, doesn't it? It unsettles us as God's son takes on flesh to deal with our sin. It unsettles us because it is so profoundly and immensely good. We spend all of our lives and nature ignoring God and God continues to pursue us like this. It's unsettling because it confronts our sin. Our sin which we deny, which we minimise, which we call by other names. Our natures which we excuse. Grace is unsettling because it calls us to confront who we are. Grace is unsettling because it doesn't work the way we think it should. In fact, it's so unsettling because in our culture, grace is so countercultural. Giving someone what they do not deserve when they deserve something else. Could you possibly be unsettled by grace at Christmas? Please be astounded at God's desire. Christmas is the expression of God's deepest desire. I want to be with you. And we recognize that desire at Christmas, don't we? The desire to be with our mob. God's desire is to be with his people even as they reject him. That desire is expressed at every Christmas 
the climax of Christmas is the cross of Easter where God defeats the barrier between us and him. That's why it's appropriate to celebrate the Lord's Supper at Christmas, to see where it leads. There is much that will astound us this Christmas. The gifts we receive, the taste of food, the thoughtfulness of others, the enjoyment of family. But please be astounded at this. God wants to live with us. And he does everything to overcome the sin that stops it. Finally, please pay attention to Joseph. It's a slightly left-field suggestion. I haven't heard many sermons on Joseph at Christmas. But notice what Joseph does at Christmas. Notice the way he listens and obeys. He considers the very clear word of God and he responds wisely. Will we? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you for the familiarity of Christmas, uh, for the events that we know and the flow and the, the figures, the players on the stage. But Father, thank you for the opportunity to sit and observe and perhaps see it from a different angle. Father, as we do, please astound us by your desire, amaze us with your grace, confront our nature and bring us back to you. Father, thank you that you remain deeply concerned about a broken world and at Christmas we remember that. Thank you for Jesus. Amen.